Hello everyone, this is uh, Avijit Parai. Uh, in this video, we are going to talk about the focused cardiac ultrasound. Uh, this is also called um, as a bedside ultrasound or bedside echocardiogram. Um, personally, I prefer the term focused cardiac ultrasound or just focus because it gives us um, more uh, reasonable uh, explanation as uh, what it is. The moment I say bedside echocardiogram that gives the false impression that it may be uh, the echocardiogram with all the quantitative um, assessments or quantification. But when we do the focus cardiac ultrasound, we don't do that. So in clinical practice, we do the focus cardiac ultrasound all the time in the emergency department, in urgent care settings, in intensive care or critical care units, in the theater, the anesthetists perform this, in the ward, um, a medical ward or surgical ward, uh, it can be done as well. It's a part of the point of care ultrasound um, where we look at the heart. So we'll show you a lot of, lot of images, animations, and a lot of clips uh, to have a good understanding. And if you, uh, if you watch this video till the end of it, you will have a very good understanding about the bedside echocardiography or focused cardiac ultrasound. I am expecting that um, a lot of questions will come from you. You can write a comment or uh, send me an email. Um, if you have not done already, please um, subscribe to the channel so that we can update you with uh, new videos every week. All right. So this is what we'll do over the next few minutes. So we'll show you a lot of, lot of movie clips. Um, we'll talk about what is focus, what is this focus cardiac ultrasound all about. We'll talk about how it is done. So that's the most important thing, isn't it? So in clinical practice, how to hold the probe, where to hold it, that is all about the, um, the focus, how it is done. We'll also talk about uh, different tips and tricks to get the best images and for the best um, uh, optimization of the views and um, best interpretation of this, um, of this uh, clinical tool. We'll also show you a couple of uh, new research and new evidence to keep you updated about the focus cardiac ultrasound. So the first thing first, what is focus? Now, as, as the name implies that uh, this is a focused assessment of the heart. This is not a formal echocardiography, but it is a type of echocardiography where we have got some specific questions. Does the patient has got a pericardial effusion? Is the patient dehydrated? Is the patient of fluid overloaded? Is there any aortic dissection? Is there any severe valvular disease or a heart failure? Right? Is there any inequality between the right ventricle and the left ventricle? Or some wall motion abnormality that may indicate some myocardial ischemia? Yes or no? The answer is yes or no. It's not how much is the uh, ejection fraction or how much is the um, the EA ratio or EE prime ratio. So that is uh, ice in the cake, that is ice on the cake, and that is that is echocardiography, that is a comprehensive quantitative echocardiography. When we talk about focus cardiac ultrasound, we give dust at the point of care in the emergency department or urgent care or in the by the paramedics or even at home if the ultrasound machine is available. In cardiac arrest, we do this all the time to see if the patient has got a rhythm in the heart. It is much better than uh, uh, trying to feel the carotid pulse or the uh, femoral pulse. Um, the ILCOR guidelines have uh, recently uh, suggested that we should perform uh, the focus cardiac ultrasound um, for the assessment of the heart during the cardiac arrest. So that is about focus cardiac ultrasound or in short focus. So this is a good definition which was published uh, in a in a uh, journal article from the American Association, uh, so American Society of Echocardiography, and uh, this suggested that the focus cardiac ultrasound is basically the it's an adjunct of the physical examination. So we still need to take the history, do the palpation, percussion, auscultation, and then as an adjunct we can use the ultrasound to identify what is a cardiovascular system performance of this patient. 
So basically, we are using the uh, the ultrasound as like a stethoscope. It is more than a stethoscope because we can see and we can show the patient what is happening in the cardiovascular system. So that is about a focused cardiac ultrasound in short. Now, as I mentioned, that there are some specific questions to answer. And these are these five questions that usually we try to answer. The, what is the fluid status? What is the aortic uh, condition of this patient? What is the ejection fraction or the uh, uh, ventricular function? And how about the pericardial effusion? And what is the equality? Uh, for example, the one wall motion abnormality or uh, the right ventricular strain pattern. So these are the main five questions that we try to answer in this uh, special type of point of care ultrasound. We call this bedside echocardiography, but more appropriately, focused cardiac ultrasound. So the first question is, what is the fluid status? If you carefully look at it, um, this is, we are looking at the inferior vena cava. So inferior vena cava is the entry route of blood to the heart. So we are looking at the entry, how much blood is going into the heart. Then we look at the aorta, how much blood is pumped out of the heart and how it is happening. So look at the aorta, look at the ejection fraction. So that is the exit. Next, we look at the ejection fraction or the functional status of the heart. There are different ways of doing it. You can just uh, formally measure the ejection fraction by the M mood. Uh, there is a technique called EPSS, that is the end, uh, end point septal separation. Um, that is one way of doing it. The other way of doing it is something called Simpson's technique in the apical four chamber view. And also in the parasternal short axis view, you can do this with the uh, M mood. I'll show you some of the animations in this uh, in this uh, uh, presentation. And obviously, a big E will be effusion. Does the patient have a cardiac tamponade, or this is just a pericardial effusion that needs uh, immediate intervention? There may be some small pericardial effusion without uh, any much clinical significance as well. And of course, the last E but the, not the least, is the equality, which means is there any wall motion abnormality, which indicates either fibrosis or myocardial ischemia, or is there any um, uh, akinesia, dyskinesia, hypokinesia? We'll talk about it in details further. Also, uh, we will we'll try to find out if there's any right ventricular strain pattern. If the right ventricular pressure is higher, then that in the left ventricle, that is not a good sign. It usually means that there is a right ventricular strain pattern. In the emergency situations or critical situations, this may be because of acute pulmonary embolism. But also it can be because of chronic conditions like a COPD or pulmonary hypertension. So uh, these are the five E's. So in summary, we are looking at the entry, exit, ejection fraction, effusion and equality. So there is this great paper by uh, Kennedy Hall and the colleagues. They described about it. Um, this is a, a paper uh, which was published in the Academy Emergency Medicine Journal. And uh, this is based on the um, emergency medicine physicians performing the focus cardiac ultrasound or best echocardiogram. And they, there is no specific protocol that is suggested from the uh, American Society of Echocardiographers, but um, the emergency physicians find that if we look at those five things, as you see here, the entry or entrance, exit, ejection fraction, effusion, and equality, the five E's, that will give you some a good idea about the cardiovascular status of the patient. So the most important thing is how to do it, how we can get the best uh, images and clips to uh, find out what is happening to the cardiovascular system of this patient. So it's all about the views. So we need to have some very good, beautiful views. Um, we may have initially, uh, we may have to spend some time, but as you get more um, accustomed to this, as you do it hundreds and hundreds of them, uh, you will get really beautiful views. The only way you can improve it is by practice.
I have done probably thousands of them, but still I am learning and I sometimes struggle to get the best views. So you may not get best view in every patient, especially if there is an obese patient is struggling to get good views. We call this endomorph habitus, but in ectomorph people like linanthine people, usually you will get beautiful views. Younger people, you will get beautiful views. So it's all about the views. So that's me. Someone has stolen my shirt. I do apologize for that. So the main views that we uh, perform in the focus cardiac ultrasound are subcostal view. When we put the probe in the sub subcostal area or epigastric area, we'll talk about it in details and show you some images. The second views are the parasternal views, like the parasternal long axis view, parasternal short axis views. There are a lot of views. There are eight or nine different views in this parasternal position. And of course, we perform the epical four chamber view. Uh, in case of the parasternal uh, views and the epical views, preferably patients should be leaned a little bit to the left. If sometimes I find it that we need to rotate the patient all the way to the left to get a good views. But uh, as I've said, in young, healthy people, you might get a very good view without much uh, change of the position. So these are the main views, but also there may be suprasternal view, the right parasternal view, which is in which you use a special type of probe. Again, that is probably beyond the scope of the point of care ultrasound. It may be a little bit more details. It may be ice on the cake. Right. So let's talk about the subcostal views. Sometimes this may be the only view that you will get. For example, in a patient with cardiac arrest who is lying supine, and your colleagues are performing the um, um, chest compression, you will not be able to rotate the patient to the left. So this is a subcostal view, which is from the uh, emergency medicine point of view or critical care point of view. This may be the only view that you will get. There are, there are multiple views in the subcostal area. So let's uh, talk about it in little detail. So that's me again, and that's my heart. Now let's get oriented with this heart. So obviously this is the right side, this is the left side, this is the under surface and this is the superior or uh, the uh, um, towards the head, cephalic area. This is the right atrium here and this is the right ventricle here. This is the left ventricle here and this is the left atrium here. This is the apex, this is the LAD artery and this is the right coronary artery here. Um, this is the superior vena cava. We cannot see the inferior vena cava here. And this is the ascending aorta, arch of the aorta, brachiocephalic trunk here. And this is the left common carotid artery, left subclavian artery. This is the infundibulum. The pulmonary valve lies here. And uh, just behind it, there is the aortic valve. Um, this is the pulmonary artery. This is the right pulmonary artery. And this is the left pulmonary artery. They divide further. So if we understand this anatomy, then it will be very easy to understand the views. Now, as you understand, just below the heart, there is the diaphragm somewhere here. And uh, then uh, we have got the liver, just below the diaphragm. So this is the right lobe of the liver and this is the left lobe of the liver. The beauty of the liver is this has got very nice condensed ecotexture and we can, we can, we can use this uh, left lobe of the liver to get a good view of the heart from the inferior surface or from the uh, bottom of the heart. Because the lungs are lying around the heart on the right side and on the left side, it's sometimes very tricky. And the, and the sternum is sitting just in front of the uh, heart as well. So it can be really tricky to get a good view on the side. So this may be the only view that you will get by putting the probe just over here. Now, as you can realize that if you put the um, phased area probe just below the uh, GFIR process, the ultrasound will be transmitted to the heart. Now you can tilt it to the right and to the left to get a better view. You can rotate it a little bit clockwise or anti-clockwise to get a good view. So it's all about playing with the probe. And sometimes I find that if the patient is awake and um, I ask them to uh, bend the knees, and uh, if the patient is supine and bend the knees and relax the muscles, then um, then we can get a good view. Sometimes I might have to 
push the probe quite uh, hard to get a good view. Now in this view, the probe marker is on the left side. So this is some, there is a bit of controversy that where should be the probe marker. Now the cardiologists uh, perform uh, the uh, this particular view when the probe marker is on the left side. The ultrasonologists, ultrasonographers and the uh, radiologists, they put the probe marker on the right side. Now, because most of the papers, most of the teaching materials are performed by the uh, cardiologists, I personally prefer uh, to put the probe marker on the left side because that, that way I can correlate with most of the journal articles. If I follow the uh, radiologist uh, protocols, I get confused. And uh, so let's keep it simple. We will put the probe marker on the left side and then uh, we will get a good view from the under surface of the heart. So let's see how my heart is doing. So this is a, a clip as you can see here. So this is the left lobe of the liver, right? And this is the right ventricle here. This is the tricuspid valve here. This is the right atrium here. This is the interventricular septum and this is the interatrial septum here. This is the left atrium here and this is the mitral valve the anterior uh, leaflet and the posterior leaflet. These are the cordy tendini as you can see and um, this is the left ventricle here. If you carefully look at it, there are some other structures that you can identify. These are the pulmonary veins. So this is one pulmonary vein and there may be, um, there may be one pulmonary vein here. There is one pulmonary right pulmonary vein here and sometimes the one pulmonary vein is sitting just at the level of the interatrial septum. Now, as the patient is breathing, we are not getting any stationary picture or same, the same picture all the time. So it is changing position. That's why sometimes you will see that the aortic valve is uh, popping in to the picture. Uh, if the patient is alcoholic, sometimes the, um, there may be fatty liver and that can, uh, that can compromise the picture in these subcostal views. So that's the classic view that you might get in a patient who is similarly unstable. Now, if you rotate the probe, uh, let me see. Yes, if you rotate the probe anti-clockwise, then you will get this type of view. So what we are seeing here is, again, this is the liver. And these are the hepatic veins. This is the inferior vena cava. And there is this little valve, as you can see here. This is the eustachian valve at the opening of the inferior vena cava to the right atrium. So this is the right atrium here and just above it, if you carefully look at it, this is the tricuspid valve and so this is the right ventricle here. And um, um, this is the left atrium, this is the interatrial septum. So that's that may be the only view to identify, but this may be a very important view because it will give you a hell lot of information. For example, you can um, freeze the image and then you can measure the diameter, anteroposterior diameter of the inferior vena cava. For example, if it is more than 2.5 centimeter or 25 millimeter, that means the patient is uh, fluid overloaded. If it is less than one millimeter, sometimes you might see that during inspiration, there is what you call a kissing effect. So the anterior wall and the posterior wall, they will come in contact with each other. So if you put the uh, M mood here, M mode uh, marker here, you will see that uh, what is happening during inspiration. So during inspiration, there will be collapse of the inferior vena cava and during expiration, uh, it will dilate. Now in this particular person, uh, as you can see that during inspiration, there is not much um, collapsing of the inferior vena cava. What it means is that, that the JVP is a little raised. So this is a patient where you should not give too much fluid. On the other hand, if there is a collapse of the inferior vena cava, especially during inspiration or even when the patient is uh, uh, holding the breath, if there is a collapse of the inferior vena cava, I will give some fluid if the patient is similarly compromised or if the patient needs it. So everybody is different. So we need to look at the bigger picture. We need to look at the history, examination, the clinical context, and then you interpret these images and the clips to see if we need to give fluid or avoid the fluid. 
So this is a very good uh, uh, picture or clip that will give you a lot of information. We'll have some other views, other videos, where we'll talk about exactly how to measure the JVP on the basis of the infrared cover. So these are the subcoastal views. As I've said again and again, this may be the only view that you will get in an unstable patient, for example, in cardiac arrest. Now, let's talk about the parasternal long axis views. Uh, I'll show you mainly one view, but if you tilt the probe a little bit carefully or caudally, you might get a uh, lot of other uh, uh, views. So this is the parasternal long axis view. Once again, that's me, and that's my heart. Now, imagine if you put the probe in such a way that um, the marker of the uh, phase array probe is directed towards the right shoulder. The, we will cut the heart along the axis of the heart. And that is when we'll get a very good view called the parasternal long axis view. So once again, uh, this is the heart um, that I used uh, in my videos on ECG, but uh, this is the same heart that we can use for the uh, best psychocardiography as well. So let's get oriented with the structure. So this is the right atrium here, and this is the right, right ventricle here. The left atrium is here, and left ventricle is here. This is the interatrial septum, and this is the interventricular septum. And this is a tricuspid valve, which is connected to the wall through the cordy tendini and the um, papillary muscles. And again, this is the mitral valve, which has got the cordy tendini and the papillary muscles here. And this is the aortic valve here, and this is the ascending aorta. This is a superior vena cava. And you can see that there are some arteries. This is the right coronary artery here, and this is the left circumflex artery here. So imagine this is the heart, and we are putting the probe in the parasternal uh, long axis view. If we put the ultrasound probe and turn it on, then the ultrasound will uh, go just like this. Now, if you tilt the probe a little bit uh, to the right, to the left, cephalic and caudal direction, then you might have a very good view of the right ventricular outflow tract here at the top. And just below this, there will be interventricular septum and then the left ventricle here. You will also have a very good view of the mitral valve. Um, and then you will have a good view of the uh, aortic valve as well. Again, if you tilt the probe a little bit um, on a cephalic direction, and sometimes I might have to put the probe one intercostal space above, then I might have a very good view of this ascending aorta as well. Again, sometimes this may be the only view we see will get. And these are the patients I, I, I usually put the patient in the left lateral position. Um, keep the right hand on the thigh and the left hand above the hand, above the head. Then you will have a very good view. Uh, let's show you some examples. Uh, I know that it's a little dark, but uh, that's that's the only view I have at this moment. So let's get oriented. I have some better views in a minute. So this is a parasternal long axis view. This is the right uh, ventricle here. And then this is the interventricular septum. There is the aortic valve here, and this is the ascending aorta. This is a mitral valve here, the anterior cusp and the posterior cusp. And this is the left atrium here. Then this is the left ventricle here. As you can see that we cannot see the apex of the heart very well because the left lung is covering up. And ultrasound does not like air. There is a higher attenuation, or the ultrasound basically is destroyed in air. That's why we put gel on the ultrasound probe. So that's a, uh, that's a, that will give you some rough idea about what it is. Let's show you. If we put the color Doppler, then you will see that there is something happening here. There is some backflow of blood from the left ventricle to the left atrium. So basically there is a mitral regurgitation. All right. Now, if you put the m mode probe just at the level of the tip of the anterior cusp of the mitral valve or anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, you will see these images. What you can see here is this is the right, this portion that represents the right ventricle or right ventricular outflow tract. Then this portion indicates this between the two white lines, that is the interventricular septum. If you carefully look at it, there is this, um, the, 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 this line, this white line, this is not very clear, 
but that is the only line you may be able to see. This is the anterior cusp or anterior leaflet of the mitral valve. And then we have got just below this, this is the um, lateral wall of the left ventricle. Now, what you can see here is the distance between the uh, tip of the, um, the anterior uh, leaflet of the mitral valve and the interventricular septum. So this distance, that is what is called EPSS or the E-point septal separation. So if we measure it, so there are two waves here, if you carefully look at it. So there is one wave here, one wave here, and then there is a, not very clear, but still you can see here, this is very good. So th this is called E-wave because this is what happens during the early diastole of the left ventricle. And when there is an atrial kick, you will get the A wave. So E wave is the early diastole and A wave is the atrial kick. We are more interested in measuring this distance between the interventricular septum and the E wave. If it is less than 7 millimeter, that is normal. However, if it is more than 10 millimeter, highly likely that the ejection fraction is less than 50%. It has got about 90% sensitivity and specificity mm -hmm. to uh, to interpret that EPSS. So this is the one way of uh, getting some idea about the ejection fraction of the patient's heart. Another thing that we can do in this uh, parastral long axis view is to measure the diameter of the ascending aorta. So as you can see, uh, this is a still image and this is the ascending aorta here, the aortic valve is here. So if we measure distance from here to here and that is 36 millimeter or 3.6 centimeter normally it should be less than 4 centimeter or 40 millimeter so this patient does not have an aortic aneurysm by definition all right so let's see another parasternal long axis view uh, same uh, type of picture so you can see little pericardial effusion here sometimes you need to be very careful about the pericardial effusion because there may be some uh, epicardial fat that will also be radiolus, uh, sorry, not radiolucent, uh, that will be um, uh, uh, lucent in uh, the uh, sono, sono, what's called, um, there will be black in color in ultrasound. So once again, this is the right ventricle here. This is the interventricular septum. And then we have got the um, right ventricle here. This is a mitral valve and this is the left uh, atrium and this is the aortic valve here and ascending aorta portion of it. Uh, as you see that there are a couple of things we can appreciate here. The tip of the anterior cusp or anterior leaflet of the mitral valve that is almost touching the interventricular septum. And if you put the M mode here, you'll be able to identify exactly what the distance is between the tip of the anterior leaflet and the interventricular septum and you will appreciate that this will be well below seven millimeters so what we can say from by looking at this clip is that the ejection fraction of this patient will be pretty good right so you don't have to go through the simpsons technique and a lot of other uh, 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 calculations to to uh, identify exactly what uh, the ejection fraction is you can just uh, look at this picture and that will give you a very good impression. Let's have a look at another uh, patient's uh, parasternal long axis view. Now, what you can see here is, very obvious thing is, so let's get oriented with the structure. So this is the right ventricle. This is the interventricular septum. The aortic valve is here and this is the ascending aorta. This is the left uh, ventricle here and this is the mitral valve. And this is the left uh, atrium here. This uh, circular structure is the descending thoracic aorta. And this ocean of uh, blackness, uh, this black uh, area, that is the pericardial effusion. Sometimes it can be a little confusing to identify what is pericardial effusion and what is pleural effusion. The way I do it, or everybody does it, is to identify the relationship of this black area with the descending thoracic aorta. If this black area is in front of the descending thoracic aorta, that is pericardial effusion. And if it is behind the descending thoracic aorta, that is pleural effusion. 
Now, in this particular clip, it may be a little strange and difficult or challenging to see whether it is in front or behind. But if you tilt, if you tilt the probe a little bit up and down, you might have um, identified that this fluid is actually in front of the descending thoracic aorta. So, the from this picture, we have got a few impressions. Number one, there is some amount of uh, a pretty decent amount of pericardial effusion. I will not call it a cardiac tamponade because there is no collapse of the right ventricle in this picture. The second thing I can get is the the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve that is almost touching the interventricular septum. So I can say that with uh, pretty much good confidence that the ejection fraction is pretty normal. So by just looking at this picture, you will have a very good idea. If you still want to do formal EPSS measurement or the endpoint septal separation measurement, you can just put the m mode probe here at the level of the tip of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve, and you can measure the distance between the A wave and the uh, sorry E wave and the interventricular septum. And I'm pretty sure this will be about two to three millimeter, which means there is a very good ejection fraction in this patient. So that's uh, that's really good uh, picture. Now, as you can see that uh, if the patient is obese, usually it's very difficult to get views. But this patient, the, the liver is pretty good and there is a lot of fluid around the heart. And usually if there is a lot of fluid, you will get really good views. Let me show you another uh, parasternal long axis view. Now, this is very important view and this is a very important diagnosis. So what you can see here is there is this large area of blackness around the heart. So this is a pericardial effusion. This is the right ventricle, which is collapsing. Can you see that? It's almost like somebody is uh, jumping on a trampoline. And uh, that is classic feature in case of this particular condition. This is the interventricular septum, and this is the uh, left uh, ventricle. Then we have got the mitral valve, the anterior leaflet and the posterior leaflet. And this is the aortic valve, and this is the ascending aorta. And this is the left um, atrium. So let's uh, interpret it in a systematic way. So there are quite a few E's we can answer from this question, from these uh, uh, views. First of all, the right ventricle that is collapsing during the uh, diastole. So what is happening during the diastole? The pressure here in the right ventricle is less than the pressure in the pericardial cavity. That's why there is collapsing of the right ventricle during the diastole. And same thing will be true for the right atrium. If you look at the left atrium, again, this is collapsing during the diastole. That is because pressure here is less than the pressure here. By definition, this is cardiac tamponade. The second information I can get is that the, this um, left ventricle that is very busy, is working really hard. We call this hyperdynamic ventricle. The third information I can get is look at the tip of the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve that is far away from the interventricular septum even during the diastole look at that so this distance will be more than 10 millimeter right so this this is two millimeter uh, this is two centimeter or 20 millimeter so this is probably uh, 15 uh, millimeter quite easily what it means is that the ejection fraction is not very good and aortic valve looks okay to me. The ascending aorta does not look very dilated. So my diagnosis in this uh, condition will be cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is a clinical diagnosis. So we need to check the blood pressure. We need to check um, the hemodynamic status um, and the background of this, of this person. Now, the, in cardiac tamponade, there is a rapid, fast accumulation of fluid around the heart. And that is why there is this collapsing of the atria and the ventricles. Uh, if uh, this cardiac uh, pericardial effusion has developed over several months or years, the body will get adjusted and the hemodynamic compromise may not happen. So we need to take the history again, do the examination, then you do the bedside echocardiography or the focus cardiac ultrasound to get a idea about what is happening. So I think this is a really good um, clip which will give you a lot of information uh, from this single clip. And this may be the only clip that you will get.
So this is about parasternal long axis views. Now let's move on to the next views, which is parasternal short axis views. It's very easy to do that. So again, the patient is in the left lateral position and you are putting the probe in the left a third, fourth, or sometimes in the fifth intercostal space. Same area where we have done the parasternal long axis view. This time, we are rotating the probe clockwise 90 degrees. So again, that's me and we are, that's my heart, and we are holding the probe uh, just at the level of the third or fourth intercostal space, just to the left of the sternum. And uh, the probe marker uh, that will be rotated towards the left shoulder. So we'll rotate 90 degrees clockwise. Uh, clockwise? Yes, clockwise. Now you can imagine that if we uh, uh, have a look at this level and if we cut the heart at this level, this is what are the structures that you will be able to see. You'll be able to see the right atrium. You'll be able to see the right ventricle portion of it. You'll be able to see the left atrium here and you will be able to I see uh, the aortic valve as well, maybe a pulmonary valve, depending on exactly where you are uh, putting the probe to. So that is exactly what we will look at and in this particular view of the parasternal short axis views. So these are the structures which you will find in this particular view. In the center, the circular structure, that is the annulus of the aortic valve. There are three cusps here. This is the right coronary cusp, this is the left coronary cusp and this is the air coronary cusp here. If the patient is lean and thin, young patient, you might have a really good view and you will be able to identify the cusps. You might be even able to see the um, coronary arteries. The right coronary artery will arise exactly from here and the left coronary artery will arise from here. If you are lucky and if the patient is unlucky, you might see aneurysm sitting here at the origin of the right coronary artery or left coronary artery. There may be a big calcification at the level of the right coronary artery or left coronary artery. What it indicates is that there may be some ischemia in this patient because of the calcification of the origin of the arteries. And also it will show that if the patient goes to the cath lab, it may be challenging. So you can pass this information to the cardiologists uh, who are performing the uh, PCI or the percutaneous coronary intervention. And then if we look downwards, this is the uh, left atrium. Interatrial septum is here and this is the right atrium here. This uh, fella is the tricuspid valve. This is the right ventricle, outflow tract of the right ventricle and this is the uh, pulmonary valve. This is the pulmonary artery, this is the right, pul uh, pul right uh, pulmonary artery and this is the left pulmonary artery. You may not see all these structures in the same view, so you may have to tilt the probe a little bit uh, to the right, to the left, caudally and cephalic direction. The structures that we'll be looking for is, what is the aortic valve doing? Is the valve opening completely? Uh, I have seen many, many uh, patients who have got complete uh, severe calcification of this um, aortic valve leaflet and they were severe aortic stenosis which needs TIVA or other uh, procedures done. Sometimes you will see big uh, left atrium, which indicates that there may be some other condition like mitral stenosis or mitral regurgitation. Again, if you are lucky and if your patient is unlucky, then you might see some clot sitting there somewhere in the left atrium. Same thing is true for the right atrium. You may see some, this may be the only view to identify if there is any ASD or uh, tricuspid regurgitation or pulmonary regurgitation. So these are the uh, very, if you put the color Doppler here, here uh, and here, you'll have a really good views. In the MRC department, urgent care settings, or even in general medicine works, one of the view that we, we, we tend to get is to see if any uh, a patient with pulmonary embolism. There may be a big clot sitting somewhere in the pulmonary artery uh, or the branch of the pulmonary artery. I have seen a few and again this is uh, if you are lucky and if the patient is unlucky you may see some ecogenic structure sitting there in the pulmonary um, pulmonary artery that is pulmonary embolism so you don't have to wait for a ct pulmonary angiogram to confirm a pulmonary embolism and if the patient is unstable and if you find that there is a right ventricular strain pattern 
which we'll talk about in a minute. And also, if you can find that the right, uh, the, the, the pulmonary artery that is quite dilated, or if there is a clot sitting there, you don't need to wait for further imaging. And we have done uh, thrombolysis in patient based on the echocardiographic finding. So let me uh, show you some real life patients. So this is the same patient who has got cardiac tamponade. In the central structure, as you can see that there are three cusps which are closing pretty well and uh, the right, um, so the right, left and the coronary cusp and this is the annulus of the, um, of the aortic valve. This is the left atrium here, the interatrial septum is here, this is the right uh, atrium is here, tricuspid valve is here, this is the right ventricular outflow tract and then we have got the pulmonary valve uh, somewhere sitting here. If you tilt the probe a little bit um, to the left and on the on the cephalic direction, you will see the pulmonary artery sitting here, the right pulmonary artery will be here and the left pulmonary artery will be here. Obviously in this particular patient, there is a lot of uh, blackness around the heart, which is not good. Um, this is cardiac tamponade. If you carefully look at it, the wall of the right atrium that is collapsing during the diastole and by definition, that is the echocardiographic sign of the cardiac tamponade. Same thing is true for the right ventricle. So during the ventricular diastole, this is collapsing as if somebody is uh, jumping on a trampoline here. So that means that the pressure in the right atrium and right ventricle is less than the pressure in the pericardial cavity. That is cardiac tamponade by definition. So that is one uh, of the parasternal short axis views. Let's show you another one. So if you tilt the probe a little bit caudally towards the apex or towards the feet of the patient, you might see a, what is happening just below the aortic valve. And so we are cutting the heart at this level now. So this is what you will see. Um, so this is what you will see. You will see a very good view of the right ventricle and perfect view of the left ventricle just below the aortic valve. But remember that this is the area between the left atrium and the left ventricle, there's a mitral valve. So you will get a good view of the mitral valve as well. So this is the left ventricle here, and this is a portion of the right ventricle here. Mm -hmm. This is the mitral valve here. The mitral valve has got two uh, leaflet, anterior leaflet here, and the posterior leaflet here. This is called the, uh, uh, this is, this is, um, the anterior anterior commissure and this is a posterior commissure. For further elaboration, you can divide the cusps into three parts. This is A1, A2, and A3. A stands for anterior. And for posterior, we use the term P as in pita. So P1, P2, and P3. Why it is important? It is important to have a better understanding where the problem is. So for example, if you see the mitral valve, so you might see a little hole sitting there. You might see big calcification sitting here. So if you communicate with your colleagues, you can tell where the problem is. If you say the there is a big calcification or there is a hole in the A1 area of the uh, mitral valve, a cardiologist will know or a cardiothoracic surgeon will know exactly what you are meaning. So this is a, again, a bit of ice on the cake. This is not a part of the point of care ultrasound. But if you want to know more, you, if you, obviously everybody wants to do better. They want to know better. They want to improve their performance. So if you really want to master the focus cardiac ultrasound or best cardiac cardiography, you might know this is not a rocket science. It's very easy. A1, A2, A3. P1, P2, P3. Easy. So this is, uh, if you carefully look at it, the left ventricle, the wall is much thicker than the right ventricle. And also if you carefully look at it, look at the shape of the interventricular septum, which may be useful in the next uh, videos. So this is the same patient with the cardiac tamponade. And as you can see, this is the left ventricle here, which is pretty circular. And this is the right ventricle here, which is thinner. And what you see in the center, that is the mitral valve. And the mitral valve has got two cusps, which are opening and closing, just like a fish mouth. So this is called the fish mouth view. Obviously, the main destructor in this particular view is the fluid around the heart. And that is a 
pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade. We have talked about the five E's and from this view, you will know a lot of things. One of them is that there is pericardial effusion or cardiac tamponade in this person. Now, if you go even further quarterly and if you cut the heart at this level, what you will see? You will see that there is right ventricle will be here and the left ventricle will be here. And you will see the papillary muscles. That is where the papillary muscles will set. So this is the anterior papillary muscle and this is the posterior papillary muscle. Again, this is a big thick walled left ventricle and this is a thin walled right ventricle here. Now what will happen if the right ventricular pressure is higher than in the left ventricular pressure? Like in pulmonary embolism or pulmonary hypertension or COPD, core pulmonary. What will happen is the pressure here will be higher than here. So the interventricular septum will be pushed towards the left ventricle. So it looks like almost a T, isn't it? So, 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 so sometimes the colleague, my colleagues call it a donut sign. And if you take a bite on the side of the donut, it will look like a T, what it, which is not a good sign, right? If there is a donut in your hand, you will be happy and patient will be happy. But the moment somebody has taken a bite on the donut, not a good sign, uh, especially from emergency medicine point of view, because what it means is that this may be, maybe, maybe this is a uh, pulmonary embolism. Right. So uh, if you go even further quarterly, you might have a good view of the apex of the left uh, ventricle. Um, again, eyes on the cake beyond the scope of the point of care ultrasound. There are 17 segments in the left ventricle and the 17 number 17 is sitting here. Uh, sometimes it's maybe the on this may be a very good view to identify the um, identify if there is any um, wall motion abnormality. So uh, again, this is a thick walled left ventricle and this is a thin walled um, right ventricle here. So the papillary muscle still we can see probably a little bit of papillary muscle here and papillary muscle here. But again, we can see that uh, this is the left ventricle. The right ventricle is gone. Um, this view is sometimes pretty pretty good view and this is actually the view that I use for measuring of ejection fraction. What I need to do is put the M mood just in the center of the left ventricle and if you turn the M mood on, you will find the distance, um, the end diastolic uh, diameter and the end systolic diameter. And if you press on the calculation uh, button in your ultrasound machine and uh, put the end diastolic diameter and end systolic diameter, the machine will calculate uh, the uh, ejection fraction. You don't have to do the calculations. Um, and in the report, the machine will give you the ejection fraction. The only problem here is this technical problem. The problem is if you put the M mode in the center, so that will give you a very good N systolic diameter here and N diastolic diameter here, which is beautiful. The problem is very unlikely that you will get exactly the center. You will probably move to the side and as you can see, as I, I am moving to the side, the diameter is decreasing. Both in systolic diameter and diastolic diameter, they are completely different than what happens if I put the probe in the center. So it will give wrong information. So the way to uh, counter this is to measure the, um, uh, the end systolic and end diastolic diameter at least in five different levels. So you can just uh, tilt the probe to the right, to the left, caudally and on the cephalic direction to measure this N systolic and N diastolic diameter. Uh, in uh, the Sonocyte uh, export machine, um, they give you the option that you can do it five times. And at the end of it, it will give you the average reading. And I think that is pretty reliable. Um, many of the cardiologists don't like to use the M mode anymore. This is an old school method because it's not quite accurate. And ejection fraction itself is an old school um, technique. We don't use ejection fraction anymore. Um, most of the cardiologists, as far as I, as far as I am aware of, use um, speckle tracking. That gives a really good uh, idea about what is happening in the heart, for example, the left ventricle. Right. We have talked about uh, pretty in details about the parasternal long axis views, parasternal short axis views, subcoastal views. 
Now let's talk about the epical views. This is not a single view. There are multiple views. That's why I'm saying epical, epical views. The, um, uh, again, that's the heart. And um, if we palpate just below the left nipple um, in a linear and thin people, that is where the um, apex of the left ventricle is. Sometimes when you do the parastral short axis view, if you just uh, gradually follow uh, the uh, left ventricle, you might identify where the end point is, and that is where the apex is. And then you just tilt the probe. Now, uh, the marker of the probe is still towards the left shoulder. So that's my probe exactly at the apex of the left ventricle. Now, if you put the, uh, if we turn on the machine, the heart will be sectioned as if it is anterior half and posterior half. Now, if it is not done properly, sometimes it can give you what we call foreshortening, and that is not quite optimal view. So let's uh, show you again what is happening. So that's the same heart that I've shown you before. So this is the right atrium here. The left atrium is here. This is the right ventricle, and this is the left ventricle. This is the interventricular septum, and this is the interatrial septum. This is the uh, tricuspid valve, and this is the mitral valve. If you understand this little bit, and of course this is the aortic valve and this is the ascending aorta. Now if we put the probe exactly at the, level, at the level of the apex of the left ventricle, you will have a very good view of the interventricular septum, mitral valve, left ventricle, and um, uh, left atrium. Sometimes this may not be good enough to get the whole picture of the heart. Sometimes you might have to tilt the uh, probe a little bit to the left so that you can get a good view of the um, lateral wall of the left ventricle. Similarly, you might have to uh, slide the probe or tilt the probe to get a good view of the right ventricle, especially the right free wall of the right ventricle and tricuspid valve. Uh, so this is uh, the is, is all about the positioning. So you might have to position the probe. Again, these patients, I put it on the left lateral position because uh, that way I can move the uh, lungs laterally and uh, I can get a good view. So let's uh, show you some real life uh, epical four chamber view. So this is the left ventricle here, right ventricle here. This is the interventricular uh, septum and this is the mitral valve, the anterior leaflet and posterior leaflet. You can see the cordy tendini uh, and this is the papillary muscle here. And this is a left atrium here, and this is a right atrium here. Tricuspid valve is here, and we can see uh, there are these pulmonary uh, veins which are opening into the left atrium. If you carefully look at it, there sometimes it uh, it comes up. Uh, this is the uh, appendix of the left atrium, and uh, of course we have got a bit of uh, pulmonary veins which are draining uh, into the left atrium. Uh, again, this may be the only view that you will get, and that is good enough for the focus cardiac ultrasound or point of care ultrasound. Because the person is breathing, uh, sometimes the aortic valve is popping into play here. Now, this is a very important view, and I try to get the best, as best as I can, to get one of these uh, epical four chamber view. We can uh, have a good idea about the wall motion of the left ventricle. We'll discuss about this in a minute. And uh, we can have a good idea about the mitral valve. We can have a good idea about the left atrium and right atrium. Um, in case of atrial fibrillation, um, you might see that this, um, there will be some clot sitting there, right? He, and in case of mitral stenosis, mitral regurgitation, if you put some color Doppler and do some the uh, uh, pulse wave Doppler, you might actually do the quantification. And that is, again, beyond the scope of the point of the ultrasound. But who does not like eyes on the cake? Who does not like eyes on the cake? I love it. So let's um, show you what happens here. Now, before I go there, uh, let's um, see it again. So if you look at the anterior cusp, you see that there is a little nodule there in the anterior cusp, which is not normal. This usually is found in case of rheumatic fever. But also it can happen in case of the connective tissue disorders like SLE 
and rheumatoid arthritis, these type of conditions. In case of the rheumatic fever, uh, not rheumatic fever, in case of infective endocarditis, there may be some vegetation sitting there. If the patient has got fever coming with uh, the feeling not very well, tachycardic, and if you do the ultrasound, and if you find that there is some vegetation sitting there, that is one of the major criteria for diagnosis of infective endocarditis. Now, if you put the color Doppler, this is what it will look like. So the blood is going away from the probe, from the left ventricle to the left atrium, and that is uh, represented by this uh, by this uh, jet of blood. It is blue. What it means is, it is blue. That means the blood is going away from the probe, which means there is a mitral regurgitation. This little cap uh, you can see here, this is called a PISA, which indicates that this is probably a moderate amount of um, moderate amount of mitral regurgitation. The bigger size of the PISA, the bigger or more aggressive, more severe is the mitral regurgitation. I would say it is a moderate mitral regurgitation. This is very important in the in the documentation. Uh, rather than just saying mitral regurgitation, you can say moderate mitral regurgitation. So that's a very good uh, parasternal, uh, so not parasternal, apical four chamber view. In the same view, you can have a look at the uh, the tricuspid valve to see if there any tricuspid regurgitation. I cannot see much of the tricuspid regurgitation here. Now, if you if you rotate the probe anti-clockwise about 60 to 90 degrees, you may get this view. Um, so what we are doing is we are we are looking at the mitral valve, either the anterior cusp or the posterior cusp. And again, as I have mentioned earlier, the the different areas of the cusp, A1, A2, A3, P1, P2, P3. By looking at this view, you will be able to tell the cardiologist or the cardiothoracic surgeon exactly where the problem is. Is it is it A1, A2, A3 or P1, P2, P3? Now why it is important? It is important for a number of reasons. This is the uh, left atrium and this is the left ventricle and this is the wall that you can see here. By looking at the wall, you will be able to say whether there is any wall motion abnormality like echinacea, hypokinesia or dyskinesia. And also, this is one of the views that you can use for uh, the measurement of the ejection fraction, which I rarely use. Right. If you rotate the probe even further, then you will get this view. This looks exactly like the parasternal long axis view. We call this apical long axis view, or some people call it apical three chamber view. What are the things we are finding is this is the, uh, this is the left atrium. This is a mitral valve. This is the left ventricle here. This is not very clear in this picture, but interventricular septum will be here and right ventricle will be sitting here. And again, uh, the aortic valve will be sitting here and ascending aorta will be sitting here. I prefer the term epical long axis view, but some people, pre people prefer, I think they call it uh, epical three chamber view for some reason. Again, you can put a little bit of color Doppler to see if there any mitral regurgitation. As you can see that there is a bit of calcification of the capillary muscle in this patient. Now this is unfortunately that same patient I have uh, talked about, the patient with cardiac tamponade. This is apical four chamber view. What you can see here is that a very busy looking unhappy heart which is uh, trying to pump as much as, the, as, as it can. Obviously there is, this is, this is uh, the heart which is almost like drowning in water. And there is a lot of uh, fluid because it is anechoic, probably this is blood or it may be some just uh, pericardial fluid, serous fluid. Because this fluid has collected quite rapidly, there is collapse of the right atrium and the right ventricle during diastole. And as I mentioned several times, this is the definition of cardiac tamponade. So this is a left ventricle here, this is a right ventricle here, interventricular septum is here, the interactal septum is here. The right uh, right atrium is here and the left atrium is here. As you can see, the uh, left atrium and the right atrium, both of them are collapsing uh, during the diastole, which means that the pressure in the pericardial cavity is much higher than the pressure in the uh, atria. By definition, this is cardiac component. Now, this is not a very common view that we do it all the time. This is called suprasternal views. 
So again, this is the um, this is the sternum will be sitting here, and this is a suprasternal notch, and uh, this is the neck. Um, if you put the probe just over here, uh, what will happen is you will be able to have a good view of these structures. So this is the ascending aorta here, arch of the aorta is here, brachiocephalic trunk is here, left common carotid artery, and left subclavian artery. So if you put the probe just over here in the suprasternal notch, you will have a good view of the arch of the aorta, um, uh, brachiocephalic trunk, left common carotid, and left subclavian arteries. And that is all we need to see. Um, I don't have very good examples, but uh, this is um, pretty much what you will see, uh, depending on uh, the uh, resolution of your computer. So this is the arch of the aorta. And uh, these uh, little structures here, these are the brachiocephalic trunk, left common carotid, and left subclavian artery. Normally, it should be less than 4 centimeter or 40 millimeter, the diameter here. If it is more than that, that is aortic aneurysm. And if the patient has got aortic dissection, you might see a little flap sitting there. So we have talked about in pretty much details about the uh, how you can get the different views, subcostal view, and then um, uh, the parasternal views, apical views, suprasternal view. Now, this is a time for cake with some ice on the top of it. This is not for everybody, but this is for people like me who is interested to know more and to help the patients with this, um, with this extra piece of knowledge and the skills. I'm pretty sure you are the similar type of uh, person. So let's have some ice on the cake. This is beyond the scope of the point of care ultrasound. So you will love it. Trust me. I cooked it very well. So this is what we do. So in case of the, um, uh, if we do the um, Doppler, the pulse wave Doppler, at the level of the opening of the mitral valve in the apical four chamber view, you might see this type of picture. So during the early diastole of the left ventricle, you see the E wave. And then during the atrial kick, you will say the A wave. So E wave and A wave. If you put the tissue Doppler on and put the uh, Doppler volume at the level of the uh, interventricular septum or the level of the annulus of the mitral valve, you will find this type of picture. So this is called the E prime wave and it's called A prime wave. What you need to do is look at the uh, relationship between the E wave and A wave. Normally, the E wave is always bigger than the A wave. Normally, the E wave will be either equal to or less than the E prime wave. E prime wave is usually bigger than the E wave. So that is normal. What happens if this um, condition develops? When the A wave is bigger than the E wave, so the E wave is smaller than the A wave. So E A ratio is less than one. There are a number of differentials. It can be impaired relaxation. It can be pseudo normal, or it can be um, uh, the uh, restrictive um, dysfunction. Now, sometimes because there are so three different conditions, what we we'll look at is we'll do the tissue doppler. Now. In comparison to the previous picture, you can see here that the uh, the first of all the E prime E wave is smaller than the E wave, but if you look at the E wave and the E prime wave, they are almost similar and certainly less than 15. The ratio between E wave and E prime wave this is less than 15. This is normal. Actually, this E wave E prime wave ratio that is similar to the pulmonary capillary waste pressure. So you can measure the pulmonary capillary waste pressure by this non-invasive method, by measurement of the ratio between E wave and E prime wave. So if you find this type of picture when the E wave is smaller than the uh, A wave, but the E, e prime ratio is less than 15, this is impaired relaxation of the left ventricle. I'm sorry, I think I, 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 I have, I have uh, said something wrong in the just a few seconds ago. So in case of the pseudo normal and in case of the restrictive um, dis, uh, diastolic dysfunction, 
the E wave is bigger than the A wave. So once again, we have got the E wave and A wave, and E wave is bigger than the A wave, which is like a normal. But if you look at the E wave, that is much bigger than the E prime wave, which means that this is a pseudonormal. And then the last uh, scenario this can happen is E wave is very tall, very sharp, much longer or much taller than the A wave. And the ratio between the E wave and E prime wave is more than 15. But look at the size of the E wave, E prime wave, and A prime wave. They're very small. This is called restrictive uh, diastolic dysfunction. So these are the two conditions in case of the restrictive dysfunction and pseudonormal, where the E E prime wave ratio is more than 15, which means that the pulmonary capillary raise pressure is high. Which means do not give too much IV fluid in these patients. However, when the E, e prime ratio is less than 15, like in case of the impaired relaxation or in normal patients, the E, e prime ratio will be much less than 15, which means if required, you can give some fluid without causing any harm to the patient. I'm sorry about the spelling for some reason. I don't know why it said dysfunctional. It's not dysfunctional, it's dysfunction. Sorry, sorry about that. Now, another uh, piece of cake, I'm, I'm, sh I'm sure you are loving this uh, ice on the cake. If not, I will uh, cook better next time. So this is the wall motion abnormality. This is a very important uh, concept, and I use this all the time. So once again, we are getting an apical four chamber view. As you can realize, this is a left ventricle here. This is a right ventricle here. This portion of the left ventricle is supplied by the LAD, the left anterior descending artery. This portion of the interventricular septum is supplied by uh, the right coronary artery. And this portion, um, you can see actually, this is the artery here, the left circumflex artery that supplies this area. So this area, once again, is supplied by the uh, LAD, this portion by the right coronary artery, and this portion by the uh, left circumflex artery. If you can just apply this knowledge, you will, uh, you will be able to tell the cardiologist exactly where the problem is. Now this is a parasternal uh, short axis view. Again, this area that is supplied by the uh, left as a left anterior descending artery (LAD). This portion is supplied by the RAD, uh, right coronary artery, sorry, RCA, and this portion is supplied by the left circumflex artery. What you will find is that if the patient has got an LAD lesion, then this portion will have akinesia or hypokinesia. Similarly, or dyskinesia maybe. Similarly, if, the, if this portion is not moving at all, there is akinesia, which means that the right coronary artery is disease. And if this portion is not moving, akinetic or hypokinetic, the left circumflex artery has got some problems. Um, there is some uh, evidence to suggest that the Echocardiographic features appear before the uh, biochemical uh, changes. So even before the ECG change, even before the raised troponin, you may find the echocardiographic abnormality. And I have seen a few patients where I could identify which artery is the culprit artery, even before ECG, even before troponin, even before the PCI or angiogram. I can tell exactly where the problem is, and that is uh, that was confirmed later. Right, so let's have a look at some new research and evidence to keep you updated on this interesting topic of focused cardiac ultrasound or bedside echocardiography. So this is um, this is a COVID time, um, and this particular paper is um, have described some of the cases of uh, the. Um, patients were coming with some chest pain and the focus cardiac ultrasound was very useful in identification of uh, these cases. I think there are three cases or four cases. Um, there was one case with heart failure. There was one patient with pulmonary embolism and there was one patient with myocarditis with thrombus. Now imagine, these are, this is a COVID time, this is a new one. And uh, if the patient comes with shortness of breath, the first thing you think of, oh, this may be another case of COVID. But by application of this point of care ultrasound in the form of echocardiography, the 
that the authors could identify that this is a heart failure or pulmonary embolism or myocarditis. This is brilliant. Uh, this particular paper was published a, a few years ago. Um, we showed that uh, the ascending aortic dissection can be detected. And I have shown you what are the different views you can use. You can use the parasternal long axis view. You can use the um, uh, uh, parasternal long axis view mainly um, to detect the um, diameter of the ascending aorta. So you can say that there is aortic aneurysm. Similarly, if you see a flap in the ascending aorta in the parasternal long axis view or suprasternal view, then you will be able to diagnose the ascending aortic dissection. That is the type A dissection which needs to go to the theta most of the time. So that is a little bit of data from uh, this uh, particular study and uh, they found that uh, the thoracic aortic aneurysm um, can be detected by this by the emergency physicians. So they don't need a formal echocardiography uh, or they don't need the uh, angiogram or CT, uh, CT aortogram to confirm that. Now, this is an Australian paper by the general practitioners. Uh, who found that if they use a focused cardiac ultrasound during the uh, GP practice is, is found to be very useful. I am an urgent care uh, physician as well as an emergency uh, medicine specialist and I sometimes uh, work in urgent care practices. So in urgent care or in the GP, we are given only 15 minutes for each patient. And within these 15 minutes, we need to take the history, do the physical examination, perform all the paperwork, documentation, and everything. Very challenging situation. But this particular paper showed that even in those busy GP practice, they could use the focus cardiac ultrasound to make some difference. For example, they found that the clinical examination failed to diagnose heart failure, the aortic stenosis, and um, uh, these are the conditions which can, could be picked up by the focus cardiac ultrasound. And it did not take much time to do that. It does not take a lot of time. And these patients uh, finally needed either referral to cardiologist or treatment for heart failure or a diagnostic uh, echocardiography, which is the formal echocardiography. So you see that you can use the focus cardiac ultrasound just like a stethoscope to get a better picture of your uh, underlying condition. This was a paper uh, by Conlin and the colleagues uh, published in 2016 in the Journal of Cardiothoracic and Vascular Anesthesia. And they found that um, the focus cardiac ultrasound uh, can be uh, performed with a minimal amount of uh, uh, training. Uh, you just need a bit of uh, theoretical lecture. For example, this one, you can use the same lecture that I am going to give you now, um, or I have given already. Uh, if you follow this uh, same technique and then practice, 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 get accredited by some formal accrediting agencies like ASUM or by other agents in other countries. And usually that is usually that is good enough to get um, um, very good um, uh, skills sets for the for the application of the focus cardiac ultrasound or bedside uh, bedside echocardiography right so let's summarize everything thank you for uh, being with us so it's all about holding the probe and how to hold it if you hold the probe in the in the just below the agified process this is the subcostal views you can rotate it 90 degrees and that will give you the inferior vena cava and this may be the only view that you can get in a critically unwell patient like cardiac arrest. If you put the probe in the left lateral position, in the just to the lateral margin of the sternum, in the third, fourth, or fifth intercostal space, uh, you can get the parasternal long axis view by putting the marker towards the right shoulder. If you rotate the probe clockwise, when the marker is uh, directed towards the left uh, shoulder, you will get the parasternal short axis views, different views. You can look at the aortic valve, mitral valve, the cap uh, papillary muscles, and you can look for a lot of things. You can look for the wall motion abnormality. You can measure the ejection fraction. And uh, of course, uh, the apical views, apical four-chamber view, apical two-chamber view, apical three-chamber views. 
these are the two views the parasternal views and the apical views i put the patient usually to the left lateral position if possible if it is not possible it's difficult to get good views because the left lung is sitting just over here right so i have talked about um, a lot of things i i feel that uh, this is a very big um, area in the point of care ultrasound we are not um, stealing uh, the job of the cardiologist or the echocardiographer but um, at the point of um, care at the point of assessment of the patient we can use the um, point of care ultrasound or focused cardiac ultrasound as a part of our regular assessment which includes history examination and some investigations and it does not take a lot of training it does not take a lot of resources all you need is a patient and a good device or ultrasound machine there are a lot of um, studies on this uh, topic and if you have some time many of these um, articles are available uh, free uh, in, in the pdf form um, if you go to the google uh, google scholar you can get them and uh, there's a lot of study going on and you can get updated uh, uh, every day but the most important thing i feel is that you need some theoretical knowledge you need uh, to understand the anatomy you need to practice the most important thing is practice 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 one of my colleagues uh, used to say that you need to do at least 300 ultrasound to get some rough idea about that particular modality so in focus cardiac ultrasound or bedside echocardiography under supervision you need to do at least 300 ultrasound scans uh, if you want i am happy to review your, your scans and give some feedback you can get in touch with uh, through my email or uh, in my website or in my twitter account and i'll be very happy to help you out with these focus cardiac ultrasound or best site cardiography. I hope that you find it useful. If you have got any questions, and I'm expecting that hundreds of uh, comments will come um, uh, in the comment section below. Um, if you uh, have got any different views, please get in touch. Um, I am happy to uh, get involved with the discussion about the focused cardiac ultrasound. If you have not done already, please subscribe to the channel and uh, share it with others. If you feel that there is something in this video that needs improvement please uh, let me know as well all right it was a great uh, pleasure being with you guys uh, thank you very much and uh, bye for now